At this point in the program, in previous years, we would be sitting in a large ballroom preparing to have a magnificent dessert. In keeping with the theme of thinking about a magnificent dessert and the year of the woman, we have a very special guest with us today. My colleague, Dr. Steinway, and I are going to ask some important questions to a sophisticated, dynamic, sweetie person who is here with us today. She started her career as an elementary school on Long Island and has become one of the most famous cake designers and cake makers of our times. She has been called New York's queen of the cake and the da Vinci of the cake. It is my great pleasure today to introduce you to Sylvia Weinstock. Sylvia, thank you so much for coming with us today. And I'm going to start out by asking you to tell us a little bit about your unique background and what inspired you to become a baker. Well, you know, I didn't start out as a baker. I started out as a kindergarten teacher and a second grade teacher. But I had a husband who I adored. And by the way, 70 wonderful years of a marriage who encouraged me to be my own person. And I encouraged him to do the things he liked. And it ended up with him having a ski house. We had a ski house near Hunter Mountain. And Ben and my daughters would ski. And I didn't ski. I went up that hill, I looked down, I said, not for me. I went home and I cooked. Now that whole area was full of French chefs because it was an hour and a half or so away from Manhattan and they would go up on a Saturday night and go back to work on a Monday. And they all skied. And I would entertain. But you know, anybody could do a roast chicken, but you needed a dessert. And I started baking. And my cakes were, I baked more than we could eat. So I started selling to the local little restaurants upstate. And before you knew it, I had five restaurants that ordered weekend cakes because it was strictly a, a small provincial area. They didn't need anything but a, a chef who would just do pastries. And so I would deliver little cakes to them every weekend. Now at that time, uh, substitute teachers made $40 a day. But I would be making like $500, a little bit from each restaurant. I would make four or five cakes for each one. So I'd turn out five cheesecakes, five chocolate cakes, five yellow cakes, an apple tart. And anyway, that's how I started. Then at one point when the children were all out of the house and my husband, who was an attorney, decided he didn't want to do that anymore. And I, at the age of 50, had breast cancer. So I was coming into Manhattan three times a week for treatment. And my husband said, hey, listen, I'm tired of law. You're getting treatment in the city. Let's move from our town, which was called Massapequa. And we moved to Manhattan in 1950. At that time, I had a friend called William Greenberg who owned some bakeries in, in Manhattan. And he let me bake in the back. And I did bake a cake for the daughter of a, uh, a friend. And she had a little bit of a takeout place on 6th or 7th Avenue at that time. And it was so pretty, it had handmade little sugar flowers on the top because I was an arts and craft person. I was a knitter, I was a needle pointer, I could sew, I was a gardener, I loved flowers. And I learned that you could take sugar dough and mold it with your fingers and make it look like a real flower. And so I made a cake for this girl, she put it in the window, and my luck was a young chef saw it, came in and found out who made it, I made it, and that one person then ordered it for her catering. So the caterer at that time was a man called Donald Bruce White, and he was in the upper 60s on the east side. And Donald used to have luncheons for the ladies who lunch. He had a garden, and you name the uh, ladies who sat on the boards of the museums and the symphony hall and the schools, they would lunch, and they saw the cake. 
well, that's all they needed. One woman had a, a party at the Carlisle Hotel, and she ordered a cake, and that was the beginning. The banquet managed saw it and said, I've never seen anything like that, and it's delicious. Because I was a home baker who used the best of butter and the best of cream and the freshest of fruit, and I never really thought of what it cost to produce it. I wasn't in business. To me, it was a nice, wonderful hobby. But from there, it, it hit town. The Pierre heard about it. The Plaza heard about it. And so from one cake, it went to one cake. It went to this size cake until it became a monumental structure. And I never advertised. But it was word of mouth, and it went around the world. And because of that, I have traveled to the Middle East. I've been to Abu Dhabi and, uh, and, and, I, and uh, just name it. I've never been to Saudi Arabia, but I went to all of the others. I've been all through Europe. We sent cakes to India. We sent cakes to South Africa. So Morocco, I mean, just name it. We became known around the world. And because of that, I ended up with a business a staff of 17 people, sleepless nights, pad and pencil by the bed, because you wake up at 2 in the morning and you remember something, and uh, lots of satisfaction, lots of joy, and a, a name. So that even today, when I walk down the street, I will run into people that say, you did my wedding cake 25 years ago or 30 years ago. And I frequently ask the same question. Still married? <laughs> I've done weddings for the third round. I did the first one, the second one, and the third one. And you could say that about many people. Then I sometimes even got to do the wedding for the divorced wife when she <laughs> remarried, and Thanks. the children. So when you're in business for almost 40 years, You've seen a circle of life. It wasn't easy. I will say, for a woman at that time in the food business, there was a great deal of prejudice to overcome. I can remember going to Paris with a wedding cake for a, an American couple. And we had to finish it and do most of it in the kitchen of the George Sank. And I went down to there, and there were four or five young French men, pastry chefs. Well, they took a look at this 50-year-old Jewish-American woman and said, what could she do? She's not a French. She's not a pastry chef. She's, what is she? Well, they gave me a corner. They weren't particularly helpful, but they did come look periodically to see what was happening. When the cake was finished, and it was, we mounted it up so they could take a picture of it, they were so astounded that they brought out a bottle of champagne to toast me. Then we had to take it apart, put it into a truck to deliver it to the site. So, I mean, the prejudices were there, and they still exist for women in every field, uh, I think, there are certain fields that are almost barred for women. They really had a struggle. And as one of my clients was Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who I had the pleasure of doing many cakes for, and the pleasure of meeting her and having tea with her. And I'm just to, just to hear the feelings that she had, the fight that she had, with a supportive husband, as I had a supportive husband. So I think. What you must do if you're going to be uh, a figure in the world today is get the supports you can that sustain you, and you need it. And whether it be a sister or a partner or a family member or a husband, or a, doesn't matter. You need support. You cannot do it alone. And I'm grateful for the long life that I've had with this because I am now 90. I've had breast cancer, I've had lung cancer, 
and I'm looking forward to champagne on my 100th birthday. That gives me 10 more years to make noise. Yes. Well, I've seen your cakes and they are stunning, but what do you think is one of the most challenging cakes that you've made? Well, they're all challenging. The challenge is to feed the fantasy of the bride and groom. So people come from diverse parts of the world. They have different palettes. They have a different feeling about what they want. I mean, you could get someone who is very simplistic and wants something that's very clean and sophisticated, or you get someone who wants all the bells and whistles on it, and that's what she gets. So you have to read your client, mm -hmm. and you have approximately an hour or so to do it because they come to see you for a tasting. They help you design the interior of the cake. We had samples of little pieces of cake and different fillings, and you have the fun of picking out what you want. Mm -hmm. And then we work with the florist or the design, or sometimes it's the lace on a wedding dress that you want replicated. Sometimes it's a figurine. I mean, I can remember doing a Ralph Lauren daughter's wedding, and she wanted something very personal. In other words, she gave us an idea for the design. Mm -hmm. We took pieces of sugar, and hand-painted on the sugar scenes of their romance. They skied, they biked, they hiked, they, you know, they did things together, and each was a scene for them, and that was mounted around the sides of the cake. Wow. Also the color. This is a bride that loved turquoise. So the cake had turquoise trim on it because we, didn't, we never used fondant, which is a pre-prepared covering for cakes. I don't like it, I don't think it's real. We only used buttercream, and we used the finest butter you could buy. So uh, we would add in sugar that coloration, never directly on the cake, because we want you to eat it. And you know, we had clients that wanted uh, rhinestones on it, they wanted a sparkle. I said, we will do that on one condition. You, want, you have to give me a waiver that if anybody cracks a tooth on a piece of rhinestone, we're not gonna be sued. Mm -hmm. So you learn a lot in this business. You learn to protect your product, which is uh, not easy. But and when you fly a cake and it goes into the whole cargo of, we used to use United Airlines, you worry about going back and forth. We would deliver it at early in the morning. It would be offloaded when it destination. People had to call and tell us that it arrived well. And if it was a big wedding, either I would go or one of my staff would go. And they always came with a doctor's kit, extra. <laughs> extra layers, extra cream, extra flowers, should something happen. And you know, in 40 years, I can think of one or two times something happened that was not our fault. Let's move on to the eyeglasses that seem to be an, a signature logo in many of your cakes. Can you tell us a bit about why you chose to use eyeglasses on some of your cakes? Well, I, I know I needed eyeglasses. And one day, we had delivered a cake to Palm Beach, and we were walking down Worth Avenue. And I passed this shop that had these big glasses in there. I said, oh, that's great. I love the look. So I went in to find out and price them. When I got the price and I told my husband, he said, $1,500 for the frame only? Forget it. You'll get it cheaper in New York. Well, I went back to New York and I looked all over. I couldn't find it. So I called, moment of independence, I called the shop in Florida, they sent up the frame, and then I had these graduated lenses put into it, and then they opened a branch in Manhattan, and I went in to them, and they said, you know, these, you're wearing plastic, and you wear them every day, they must be heavy. We will make you a pair of horn glasses very lightweight. These are the horn glasses, and you're talking about maybe $2,000. Uh, 
And as my husband said to me, $2,000? Sylvia, you taught a whole year for $2,000 when you were a school teacher. How do you buy glasses for, for that kind of money? I said, I'll tell you why, Ben. It's a bargain. If I don't have the glasses, I'm going to get dangling diamond earrings. You can't wear them with these glasses, so buy the glasses. <laughs> and that's the story of the glasses, and they became a signature. If Picasso could sign his paintings, we decided to sign our cakes. So I had a little sugar disc made with my name and the eyeglasses on, and every cake that went out got a sugar disc. And people started collecting them. Wow, that's fascinating. I love that. So 2020 is designated as the year of the woman since it's 100 years since the 19th Amendment was passed. So what are your thoughts on this? My thoughts on women? And the year of the woman. I think it's over, it's about time. It should have happened a long time ago. If you, even in the food industry, every chef will tell you his mother was a great cook and he learned from them. So, you know, the women have always been put down and it's about time we survive. I want to tell you something else. If the women ran the world, Women don't send their sons to war. You would have a more peaceful world and a more regimented world. And I think some of these people need a good spanking. I agree. In the College of Optometry, many of our graduates are women, but our class is about 75% female. Many of them go on to own their own businesses and their own practice, professional practices. What advice would you give to a woman who wanted to start their own business based upon your career and you are starting your own business from scratch? Well, number one, if you're going to start your own business, you better have some good emotional support, whether it's your mother or family, husband, friends, whatever, because you'll have moments of self-doubt and fear. Can you pay the rent? Uh, did, you, did you do the right prescription? Did you get it all together? I mean, there are fears, and you're going to need someone who's going to push you in and say, don't worry, tomorrow is another day. We learn from our mistakes. And for women to go on their own, I, I think it might be a good idea to apprentice yourself a little bit first and learn the market, learn uh, your vendors. You have to buy equipment. You have to buy the, the proper glasses. You don't want to sell somebody something that's going to break in no time because it was inexpensive. But you want, to, you want to put out the best product you can, and you stand behind it. So if they need a revisit, let them revisit you. Good. Who is the one person you wish you could bake one of your famous signature cakes for? I think I've done them. Great. Uh, That's great. I cannot, maybe the Bidens when he wins, okay. having done the other ones in the entire family. Oh. Uh, I've done judges. I've done enormously wealthy people. I've done movie actresses, actors, musicians. I mean, I, I don't... I would like to live long enough to do my grandchildren's weddings, but they all are very independent these days and nobody's in a hurry. <laughs> do you have any parting words for the next generation about learning and education? I think education is the key to life. And I encouraged even the people that worked for me to go further into education so that it depends an educated person can live a very good life. You need skills, and that's another issue I feel. I think we need more people that will service community. I think we need plumbers, electricians, we need uh, carpenters. Not everybody needs to have a degree and be a computer whiz. So I think we have to function in society, and in terms of Glasses and eyes, this is your great protect, this is your key to life. You can read, you can function, and uh, you must take care of, of your body, whether it is food or whether it's rest, sunshine, 
glare. I, everybody should, at every age, have an eye examination. I had kindergarten children that had eyeglasses. So don't wait until they, they're half blind and they can't see anything. Every, I think children should have eye examinations from the moment they can see. We agree. Yeah, and I think you need a pediatric. Do we have pediatric eyeglass people? Yes, of we course. do. We yeah. certainly need them because they can catch a, a problem early in life. We just opened up an entire pediatric unit, a specially designed equipment and facility on our 10th floor. Hopefully we'll get a chance to show you that yeah. in a few moments. And it should not be, a, children wearing eyeglasses should not be a stigma. And we should be able to design glasses that are funky and fun. I like that. Well, on our closing words, I have to say that this certainly served as one of the best desserts that we could have offered the audience virtually tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm sure the audience have enjoyed your conversation, and all of them would love a slice of one of your cakes one day. I hope we'll see you one day at one of our future events, and thank you so much for joining us today. It will be my great pleasure to return to you every year for the next at least 10. And after that, I'll probably want more. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.